grave robbers. One take, one time. All right. Grave robbers based in Mexico. So as you can see, it's in Mexico. It's roughly around the 1970s, 1980s. Very low class living. All right. Couple of men, Eduardo and Gomez. Very hard done by, very poor, living very rough, not knowing what to do in life, finding it very difficult to coexist in society. They find nothing else they can do for themselves except for start grave robbing. So, uh, yeah, they start grave robbing, as you could imagine, to try and pick up bits and pieces, trinkets and whatnots for the pawn shops or other places they might be able to swap it off to and uh they get in the graveyard one night they get a couple of things and they're like okay i think i'll go back to the graveyard now just one more time and uh see what i can't get myself onto and uh why they get there uh see uh they're on the way back there and they're on the bus they flag down the bus and they're on the bus sitting there with a couple of spades and the bus driver's like uh, freaking out. He's like, oh shit, taking these guys over near the cemetery, more of these grave robbers turning up, sort of peeking out a bit from it. Not really like liking it or anything like that. Makes a bit of a scene in the story I talk about. Is it going to for furthermore... They go to where they get back to the cemetery that night. And uh, they, they get in there. They're sneaking up on the cemetery. And they see the Mexican cartel. And uh, the Mexican cartel, they're burying a coffin. And uh, usually when a coffin's getting buried by the Mexican cartel at the cemetery, late at night, as you could imagine... Is filled with guns or drugs or money or anything like that. And the boys are like, Eduardo and Gomez are like, oh shit, this is great, we're about to hit the jackpot. And uh, they wait for the cartel to piss off, and uh, as they do. And uh, long story short, they get in there and they're digging up the coffin. Like, come on, they get to it. They crack the lid and inside, struggling for breath, the world's richest Mexican, Carlos Sliminen, not quite Carlos Slim, because we don't want copyrights or anything like that to get us in the uh, big release through the world. <laughs> anyway, there's the uh, Carlos Sliminen. He's been buried alive. And uh, long story into it, he's like, thank you, thank you, you saved my life. He's like... Uh, I can't go back to my to my mansion, the uh, the Aurora Barada, or whatever it's called, like the the little compound he has, and uh, so he goes back with Eduardo and Gomez to their place, and uh, Eduardo and Gomez are there, and Carlos Slimman's there, and uh, he's like, "Is there anything to eat?" and uh, Gomez, he's like, oh, shit. There's not really much to eat. They don't have much. But, see, Eduardo had this pet duck. And Eduardo had this pet duck, right? And uh, earlier that day, Gomez had been trying to learn how to hunt with a bow and arrow that he made out a bit of a pipe and some uh, string and a bit of an old stick. He was trying to make a bow and arrow. And he ended up killing the duck. And the duck's name's like Hablo, and he's like, oh, shit, I've... He's like, okay, uh, when, uh, back to it, when Carlos Slim's like, I'm hungry, is there anything to eat? Gomez is like, oh, okay, I'll go and whip something up. And Eduardo's confused, he's like, what do you mean you're going to whip something up? We don't have anything. And, like, next thing you know, if, like, half an hour later, uh, Eduardo smells this, like, delicious poultry like a ch uh, chicken shop he's like what is this coming out of the kitchen he's like freaking out he's like what the fucking next thing you know Gomez has turned up out at the table and Carlos is there. he's like oh my god what's this 
And uh, uh, Gomez has turned around and said, oh, well, not a problem. I've uh, come up with something to eat. And uh, uh, Carlos is chewing into it. He's like, oh, this is great. Thanks very much. I'm starving. And Eduardo and Gomez sitting there is like, how the fuck did you get that to eat? He's like, well, you you know your pet, Hablo, your duck? And his eyes just blow up like the expansion of a girl's gaping asshole. Just, and he's like, oh, my God, you've, you've cooked, you've cooked my pet, duck. And you turn around. He says, well, long story short, I was trying to learn how to hunt today. I accidentally killed him, so I didn't want to waste him. So I served him to Carlos and uh, Nick, Nick kills the man, falls backwards off his chair at the table as he tells him. Into a dazed delusion of grandeur, into the open mind of expansion like on the side of his mind, he has a delusion of understanding this is a little bit of Eduardo as a delusion of grandeur as he's like dreaming of good times with Hablo the pet duck. It's like, oh shit. He's like dreaming of walk, like going around in circle and a circle and a circle. And he's like, wakes up as Gomez is slapping him up the face like, come on, mate, wake up, wake up. You can't be down. Are you all right? Are you all right? I'm sorry, mate. And uh, long story short, they have to work out a plan with Carlos. And Carlos dissolves this plan after dinner. As they sit there, he's like, all right, guys, i got the perfect way to get you into the compound and get me reinstated back into my position of power because if I try to do it now, they should the desperate bitch who had me buried alive, the dark conniving evil witch, his uh, wife, who's turned against him and set it up that he'd be killed, and she's turned around to all the friends and uh, faked a plane crash, right? So on the news, there's a plane crash, like Carlos Simonon has died in a plane crash, but here he is in Eduardo and Gomez's house. Long story short, come back into it, and it turned around where they're like, all right, what's the plan? He's like, well, the wake, my funeral wake is going to be on. And when that's on, all of my friends, all of my family are going to be at the compound. And uh, from this, turns around and uh, goes, I'll organise to get you in there with the security company and uh, we'll set up a small team. We'll take a compound. We'll, take, we'll break into the compound when the wake's on and reinstate me back into the understandings of my position. So anyway, long story short, gets into it, and uh, they get through the wake nights on, and uh, they're having the wake, and Carlos and Eduardo, uh, Eduardo and Gomez are inside the compound, and they're up near the front gate. All they got to do is distract and knock out the guy at the front gate, and they're standing there confused as hell. They're like, all right, mate, you just bongy knock him like because uh, Carlos gave him a bombing knocker to knock him on the head with to knock him unconscious. He's like, all right, you hit him in the head, I'll hit him in the head. And then they didn't know what to do and the, the guards started coming up to him. like, boys, can I help you boys? And then at the same time as that, they both hit him in the head. They both knocked him unconscious. So they knock the front door and that opens the gate to the compound as Carlos comes into the compound, you see. And his wife is trying to tell everyone the condolences of his life as he's died and, oh, it's such a sad time, but, like, in underneath she's laughing and whatnot. And uh, when it comes down to it, he explains to everyone that his dark, conniving, like, conniving, destitute wife tried to organise his death with the cartel. If it wasn't for Gomez and uh, Eduardo, he'd be dead. So he tells everyone at the wake, all right, I'm going to send this destitute to America. I'm going to send my ex-wife, her name's uh, Jose. Uh, he's going to send her, her, send her to America, be homeless on the streets, locked within the understanding of an exoskeleton, a full body suit. 
a full bodysuit exoskeleton where she won't even understand because at the time she's been taken out of the facility. They've taken a prisoner from the security that was there and the guards. So he's try he's organising to send her to America, all right? And he's sending her to America and uh, he get her into America where she's locked within the exoskeleton, but within a sub psychus, she lives a large life where she's like living it up. She's got the cars, the luxury, the drugs, the big houses, everything like that, all the money, traveling the world, everything like that. But in understandability to it, she's the homeless stinky bitch on the corner who goes to the toilet over at the toilet block as she crosses the road same time every day to go to the toilet block. She then returns back. She goes to the soup kitchen. She receives a meal for the soup kitchen for later and has a meal while she's there. And then she returns back to where she stays on the street. She does this over for years and years as people try to help her, but she kindly refuses their assistance of offer. The offer of assistance kindly refuse, etc., etc. As she pushes out, the understands that Carlos has had enough. It is time to wake the destitute up. As he wakes her up from this by terminating remotely, the implant, which keep her locked within her exoskeleton, she wake up abruptly. Where's it all gone? No car, no house, destitute, stinky. She looked down at her hands. Hands be all black and dirty. Fingernails filthy and broken. She's freaking out. She's life of luck. She just come from within her sub living on the street, but. Carlos Slim's clued on to get back revenge. Turn around to her as she's trying to explain it to the people. Where's my stuff? How did I get here? What's happened? And they're like, love, you've been here for years. And they take it to the soup kitchen. And at the soup kitchen, they're like, you've been coming to this homeless soup kitchen for years. It's okay. We can help you. And she's screaming, get away from me. And she's having some psychotic attacks of delusion and psychotic attacks and the screaming and attacking people. Where is it all gone? Where is it all gone? And uh, she come into it where, long story short, they take her away for a psychiatric assessment. And uh, she fails the psychiatric assessment as she does in a delusion from being homeless on the street where the soup kitchen's there, the people from around the neighbourhood where she was homeless and whatnot. And she's there trying to confirm to them that she was a multi-millionaire, she has a big house. And they're like looking her up on the computer and they're like, I'm sorry, love, none of this exists. You seem to be a little bit confused like a crazy old lady. And... uh Long story short, she ends up living out the rest of her time in a psychiatric facility, and that was Carlos's punishment for having the cartel try and take him and bury him alive. So yeah, that's another quick story into Grave Robbers, along with the Awoken Curse and for furtherments of a few others. But yeah, peace, Jacques Marceau.